Coming up, beating the heat, how much water should you be drinking each day, especially when it's hot outside? Our pal Dr. John is here with the answers. Then, birds of a feather. Almost everyone finds puffins adorable, really intriguing, fascinating. We'll head out on an adventure to find out more about puffins. Plus, the Detroit Zoo is celebrating a birthday. We're there with details and serving up hope. These sisters from California are inspiring a new generation of tennis players. We know the benefits that can come from being involved in this amazing community and in this sport. It helps kids stay fit, stay active, stay out of trouble after school. We'll update you on their inspiring story just ahead. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's so great to be with you. I'm back on the West Coast this week, coming to you from outside NBC's Los Angeles News Bureau. Hope you guys are enjoying the summer so far. We have a lot of fun today in our program, including a fascinating look at puffins. Plus, we'll answer your latest questions, including this one. My question is about fire hydrants. Why are they different colors? But first, let's begin with one of the stories making news lately, and that is the heat. Parts of the country are experiencing some very high temperatures again this week, and one of our viewers sent us in this question. How much water should we be drinking each day? Well, here to answer that question in our Ask the Doc segment is our good pal, Dr. John Torres. So, Dr. John, how much water should we be drinking every day, especially during these hot months? And Lester, as weird as the answer is, the answer is enough water because you do, it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. Now, you might have heard that you need eight glasses of water a day when you're an adult, but that number actually came from people drinking water and getting water from their food. Think about watermelon. There's a lot of water in watermelon. There's a lot of water in lettuce. Your food has water, so that counts towards those eight glasses as well. So the overall answer is you want to make sure you stay ahead of being thirsty because once you become thirsty, that means you're a little dehydrated so drink just enough water for that but one of the keys too is trying to stay cool during the day there's a few things you can do you know from 10 to about four o'clock that's the hottest part so you want to stay in shade as much as you can wear a hat like this one from Columbia that has a big brim on it and so it certainly helps you stay cool you can make a fan from construction paper you can use that to cool off as well and of course if you drink some ice water that's gonna help keep you cool help keep you hydrated so again the answer is enough I feel like I'm interrupting your vacation like you're some someplace very <laughs> tropical. Dr. John, that's really important advice. I feel like I don't never drink an, enough, so I appreciate that advice. Good seeing you. You too. All right. Well, the hot and dry temperatures with little or no rain can also increase the risk of wildfires in many states this time of year, including California, where I am. And one of our regular viewers sent us in this question recently regarding fire protection in communities. Hi, my name is Daya and I'm seven years old and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. My question is about fire hydrants. Why are they different colors and how can firefighters know what the, it means? Thanks. Bye. Well, Thayer, those are two great questions and here to explain is an expert in the field from the Ferguson Fire Department in Missouri. Hi there, my name is Captain Ken Zielman. Um, I've been a captain here at the Ferguson Fire Department. I've been here for 17 years. And to answer your question about fire hydrants, uh, at least here in St. Louis County, where, where we're located at, uh, the water company will actually paint the fire hydrant caps different colors to designate how many gallons of minute will flow out of those fire hydrants. So we've got four to five different colors. Most of the ones you'll see are red, uh, orange and green, and then you have some blue, and then you've got hydrants that are that are not rated because they're private property. But up to 500 gallons a minute, all the way up to just about unlimited amounts of water, to whatever the hose can hold. So the color of the fire hydrant or the fire hydrant cap here in St. Louis County, which it may differ where you're at, but for the for the majority of places that I've seen, it designates how many gallons a minute will pump or will flow out of those hydrants. 
Thanks so much for that, Captain Zielman. Now let's turn to our Inspiring Kids series. Last year, we introduced you to two sisters making a difference in communities across the country and around the globe by helping donate new and gently used tennis gear to kids in need. Since we last spoke with the girls, their charity called Second Serve has grown even bigger and is helping more kids than ever before. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much coming out today. At the Kit Carson Tennis Courts in San Diego, California, you're going to set the racket. Ayana and Amani Shaw go, go, go! are helping a new generation of tennis players get in the game. Oh! Oh! Go! I won uh, a sweatshirt, a tennis racket, like bag and a water bottle. Come with us. Grab your rackets right here. Kids here are learning the basics and going home with some brand new gear. Tennis is a sport I really enjoy. All thanks to Second Serve, a charity the sisters started in 2019. I think tennis has just been a really great factor in our lives. It has taught us so many lessons. It's taught us resilience, teamwork, all these different things. And I think it's really great that sports can do that. Tennis equipment can be expensive and many families can't afford it. So Ayana and Amani decided to find a way to help others get started in a game that's given them so much. Our main mission was to get as many kids involved in the sport as we could um, because we know that tennis kind of has an elitist barrier around it. We know the benefits that can come from being involved in this amazing community and in the sport. It helps kids stay fit, stay active, stay out of trouble after school, and really productively use their time to grow as an individual. So far, nearly 20,000 pieces of tennis equipment have made their way into the hands of kids across the globe, from California to India to Uganda. So we're gonna teach you guys how to do the regular like forehand and backhand. Second Serve has started giving in-person lessons too at courts across the country. I got uh, one of those bags to put the tennis rackets in. Some cool shoes. Yeah, new shoes. That he needed for school, so that's awesome. They now run a free tennis program at this park in their hometown each week. More than 50 kids have taken lessons this year alone, and they don't plan on stopping anytime soon. When Amani and I started Second Serve, we never thought that it would get this big and have the whole tennis community behind it. I think that it's really, really amazing to see that us as kids can help other people, other kids can make an impact in our very own community. Our biggest goal really is to grow the grassroots tennis programs that we're creating in partnership with organizations throughout the U.S. And I think by doing this, we can really fuel a movement towards more activity and more inclusivity in tennis in the U.S. Nice! Star Sisters, breaking down barriers and serving up change. Joining us now is Ayana and Amani Shaw. Girls, it's great to have you see you in person. I think the last time we chatted was March of 2021 via Zoom, <laughs> like everything it seemed at, at the time. Are you marveling at how far Second Serve has gone since we last talked? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. We just never expected it to get this big. It's just snowballed, so it's really cool to see the like tennis community get behind them. So what are, what are some of the things you're seeing? I mean, people obviously have been cooked up to, during the, uh, the pandemic. Has there been a surge of interest in this? Yeah, it's been so exciting, especially at a domestic level. We've been seeing so much involvement with people our age and high schoolers just trying to give back to the community as they see that there's so much of an impact to be made right in their local backyards. Has something surprised you that in the last few months or years about where you've gone? Uh, yeah, I think really just the shift to domestic focus has been really, really um, amazing for us to see. These teenagers that are on our team are making an impact right in their backyards. And I think it's really great for them to see that the kids they are impacting, they can just go right across the highway that's next to them and see the kids that they're really helping. With. Are kids and communities reaching out to you saying we want we want in? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of local high schools in underserved communities are areas that we've partnered with. We found that there's a lot of tennis teams that are really underfunded and a lot of schools that don't have the means to support these teams. But there's such a love for a ga the game and a dream with these kids that they really want to get to the next level in tennis. And so for Second Serve to be able to support that dream and help them 
play and participate and grow through the sport has been really exciting. And, and I know a lot of this is just getting kids involved in sport, not necessarily tennis. Um, are, are, what do you what do you tell parents who who want their kids to be more active, and what do you tell kids themselves? Um, I think just whatever you set your mind to, you can accomplish. Um, we've seen a lot of success stories from these kids. For example, there was um, a girl in Nigeria, and her name was Nana Roses. And her dad said that tennis was their way out of crime, was their way out of poverty, was their way of keeping her off of the streets. And so her dream was to become a professional tennis player. And she's on the court seven, eight hours a day to accomplish that dream. So I think it's really cool to see that tennis for them is a way for them to get out of poverty and for them to really improve their living. Is there a misconception about tennis among some people about who can play and, and, and the access to where you can play? Yeah, I think so. I think there's definitely an elitist barrier around tennis. It's generally, generally considered a white man's sport and Second Serve is really trying to break down that barrier and we're really trying to create more access, inclusion, and diversity within the sport. Um, and so that's how we're really trying to accomplish our mission. Imani, how far is this going to go? We hope it never ends. We hope, this, that can, we hope that this can continue for decades to come. We really started this as something that we hope can continue to help kids all around the country and all around the world because we know that sports can really change lives and can lead to so much greatness within a person. And we hope that we can be a small part of facilitating that for under research. Well, we're happy to shine a light on it. It's been fun to be in touch with you guys and to see how far you're taking this. You are changing a lot of lives. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having <laughs> us. This is really, really amazing. I'm in your neck of the woods in Southern California. So yeah. it's great to be here. You guys amazing. take care. Thank, thank you, you so you much. Too. All right. Well, time now for an adventure with one of our feathered friends, puffins. Did you know that puffins are sometimes referred to as sea parrots? Think about it, there's a bit of a resemblance. Our pal Carrie Sanders is here now with details on these fascinating birds. Lester, I'm on eastern Egg Rock Island, which is just off the coast of Maine. This is the southernmost home for puffins and their newborn chicks. But before we meet them, just getting here, well, that's an adventure. Our journey to the island begins in picturesque Bremen, Maine. Puffins are definitely there, they're nesting. Our guide this day, Audubon's Project Puffin lead biologist, Don Lyons. He'll also be our captain as we venture into the Gulf of Maine in search of Puffin Island. They nest underground in these little secret spots. And that's what we're gonna go look at. That's what we're gonna Hopefully go we'll to see. see it. We will, we'll see them come and go. Our eight mile journey turns bumpy and wet, but then about 45 minutes into the passage, there she is, Eastern Egg Rock Island. So there we go, push well it off, here we go. Our final leg of the crossing by raft. Yeah, so I can smell that this is Bird Island. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Once on the island, We are greeted with nature's chaos. So this is incredibly active here. What are we seeing? Uh, around the edge of the island, we have common terns and active terns. The nesting Atlantic puffins that we've come to see share this island with egg-laying terns, as well as other seabirds. And for research biologists. It's like the point on their nose. They've camped here continuously for the last three months studying the puffins. We're seeing adult puffins. Adult puffins! It's hard to look away. I don't know whether it's just me. I look at a puffin and I kind of want to giggle. I mean, it looks like it's a, a toucan and maybe a penguin. It is not just you. Almost everyone finds puffins adorable, really intriguing, fascinating. Uh, even me, I'm a data-driven scientist, but I love looking at puffins. From the blinds where biologists observe feeding patterns, a slight shift from 2021. And last year, that was a big worry. A prolonged heat wave here warmed the ocean. So when adult puffins headed out to find fish for the chicks, instead of the thin, narrow herring that live in cold water and that chicks like to eat, mom and dad brought back butterfish. Butterfish like warmer water. The only problem, butterfish are fat. When puffins bring back butterfish, the chicks can't swallow that down very easily. Because? Because they're so big and they're so round. 
But this year, adult puffins are finding those thin herring again. But they're at a greater distance away from the island, which can be an exhausting flight. The herring are also showing up near the island, but much deeper than before, 50 feet down where the water is colder. They fly underwater. They use their wings to propel themselves both in the air when they're flying and when they're swimming underwater. And they're chasing the fish? They chase down fish and grab them with that impressive bill. This year, the chicks, which hatch and burrow deep between the rocks, appear to be on the rebound. What do we have here? This is actually a baby puffling. Um, puffling? Spell, yes. Okay. <laughs> their term for a baby puffin. Can I touch? Yeah. Oh, it's so soft. How old do you think this, this little one is? I would estimate about 10 days old. 10 days. So all the colors, like in the beak, that's not at birth. No, that'll come in later. What's it like holding it? It's like a light little fluff ball. <laughs> it's super light. Can I feel? Yeah. Is that okay? Oh my god. Oh, so warm. Very warm. Very yeah. warm. Would you camp with the puffins? All right, sure, right this way. Biologist Liv Ridley says camping with the puffins is a treasured expedition. This is Liv's Hobbit Hole, and it is named that because it is very small but very cozy. You live down under here? I live under here. <laughs> it's rustic, but it's fun. It's nice living the simple life, I you think. You call it fun? I think it's so much fun. I love living out here. Have you forgotten, because you've been here two months, that it kind of smells out here? <laughs> I think my nose has just completely gone nose blind. I don't smell anything anymore. Occasionally, if a bird poops, like, right on my face, I'll smell it. But yeah, besides tilt that... Tilt your head down. What is all this white stuff? Yeah, that that is bird poop. <laughs> mostly from the terns, some from the gulls. And for those who cannot get up close like we did, tourist boats pass by to give visitors a closer look at the Atlantic puffins. Another popular stop, the Project Puffin Visitor Center in Rockland, Maine. When they're out there on the open water, they've got this all black look to them. It's where we met 13-year-old Davis Stapleton and his younger brother Brooks on vacation from Tennessee. I like how they're really colorful and extraordinary and like they can carry 62 fish at once in their mouth. But they're so small, they're like the size of a, they're the same weight as a Coke can. So I thought that was pretty cool. This and four other islands, all protected just for puffins, would not exist if 49 years ago, Stephen Kress didn't demand the establishment of puffin sanctuaries before the birds all disappeared. People had hunted all the puffins hunted off them. of that island. To do what, to eat them? To eat them and to take their feathers. Because back in the day, feathers were used for pillows, they were used for mattresses, they were used to decorate women's hats. And for all those reasons, people killed puffins. And you thought to yourself, we can restore the population? They were gone. And I thought, what a loss. Isn't this terrible that some people have taken them away and future generations can't enjoy them? Maybe we could make a difference. Maybe we could bring them back. And bring them back they have. It's estimated there are now as many as 2,600 puffins off the coast of Maine. While still listed as a threatened species by state biologists, the puffins are making a comeback. A bird you might think is a cross between a colorful parrot and a penguin, all with their own personality. Puffins, also nicknamed the clowns of the sea. And I think we can all agree for good reason. Lester? All right, Carrie, thanks very much. That was fun. Finally, before we go, we want to take a moment to wish the Detroit Zoo a happy birthday. The Detroit Zoo opened back on August 1st, 1928, and this week they're marking the zoo's 94th birthday and sharing some adorable photos of the zoo animals. And here's a fun fact. The Detroit Zoo has one of the largest polar bear exhibits in the world. Happy birthday. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. And you can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.